Recording in five, <clears throat> four, three, <clears throat> two. Here we go. Take it away. Hi there. Welcome, everyone. Um, thanks, everybody, for being on the call. Uh, who we are joined with is Lori Handlers, Triambaka Levy, and Frank Mondoze, who are all uh, facilitators for ISTA. Um, and we are here today to talk about personal responsibility and sovereignty and boundaries and how do we hold ourselves as sovereign beings and hold compassion for other people, our brothers and our sisters, um, and navigating the kind of confusing topography that we find ourselves oh, in right now good. with the Me Too movement. And, uh, really you know, well, specifically, well, I brought well, you guys well, together well, on this call. Hold on, August. Um, whoever just joined well, the call, well, Alan, could you mute your um, mic, please? I think it's you. I'm not sure. Whoever just joined the call, please just mute your mics. Thanks so much. We'll say it again and again because more people will be coming on whenever. Anyway, August, when someone, when you hear the ding dong and people talking, just ask them to mute. Okay. And also shut down their camera, right, Laurie? Yeah, please mute your cameras also unless you're a speaker. Hope, can you turn off your camera, please? Sundar. Okay. Yeah. All right, so, August, please okay. go. Um, so I specifically wanted to have this call with the three of you because ISTA has been um, one of the most powerful conversations I've ever been in regarding my own power as a woman in the world, my ability to hold space for other people. Um, and I just felt like it was a great conversation to have in the context of the work that we're doing um, in changing the, the conversation around shame and sexuality. So I really just appreciate you guys being here and be willing, being willing to engage in this conversation. So thank you. Um, so yeah, can I just jump in? Please. Awesome. So I'll just start with the first thing, which is self-responsibility. Um, you know, as a kind of type A personality woman, you know, I've always felt like I was pretty powerful and responsible. But when I, what I discovered at ISTA was I could go get things done, but I wasn't actually asking for what I wanted. Um, often to get my needs met, I would go under the table. I would go undercover. Um, I wouldn't call it manipulation because it wasn't conscious, but it wasn't really self-responsible. And I, I'd like to hear how you, how we address that at ISTA and how that impacts our ability to be in relationship with others and feeling powerful in our own lives. I'm happy to start um, at ISTA. So I'm Laurie, everybody. Um, at ISTA, we have, uh, the first three days of ISTA is about self-activation. So I get to see who I am, what turns me on, what I want, how responsible I can be for myself in many contexts, including my own sexuality. I get to, um, I, I just get to work with myself in the group of other people, but mostly I focus on me. I've never focused on me before that the way I did at ISTA in my own ISTA level one. Mm -hmm. And, and we, during that time, I learned how to have a safe sex conversation. I learned how to negotiate my boundaries. I learned what the wheel of consent was and what's inside the wheel as being things that I want and what's outside the wheel as being things I don't want. And how could I talk about that with somebody and have an adult conversation the most adult conversations I've ever had in my life have come since I did ISTA level one. And I've been in this world of sacred sexuality for 22 years. I haven't been in ISTA 22 years. So there were things that I too did exactly like you, August, that I kind of hinted at and tried to get, but without saying directly, I want this, or I like this, or could I have this or no. I don't want that. I also learned to redirect my conversation. I never even heard the term redirect before. I think I knew it intuitively, but um, someone would ask me, may I be with you like sexually? And I would say, no, I don't think so. But I wouldn't mind sitting knee to knee with you and breathing. 
I would feel really comfortable about that. Or we could eye gaze. So I learned to take something that someone put on the table in front of me and turn it into something that would be more comfortable for me. And it gave me a range of possibilities. Like I, I remember this saying in, um, with women and women's groups, I'm afraid to go out to dinner with him. If I go out to dinner with him, I'll owe him something, whoever he is. And uh, I learned to be able to take whatever was coming my way and redirect it into something more comfortable for me and not feel like because I went out to dinner with somebody, I had to give over something that I didn't want to give over. Mm -hmm. You're muted. Yeah, yeah. So what I, what I like about that and what I hear in it <clears throat> is this ability to have a no, but also stay in relationship. Because um, for me as a woman, I'm, you know, I'm intuitive. I feel people, you know, and if I can feel someone would be hurt with my no, sometimes I don't say no and I go along with it and then I'm not there. I'm not 100% there. And so the option to stay connected and still be true to myself. That's a major upgrade. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to just say, um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, that what's really beautiful in this work with that we're doing with ISTA is that, so just that place that you said, August, where you didn't want to hurt someone's feelings, right? So there's a self-responsibility piece about just saying, hey, this is what's true for me. But it's also the person receiving that no. And for those who go through this training and this work, it's an opportunity for them to learn that you're just taking care of yourself, right? And that, that phrase that we famously use, thank you for taking care of yourself and really getting that your no or your boundary doesn't have to impact the core of my identity that it's not related to necessarily um, something wrong with me and that you are just simply taking care of yourself. And so there's this, um, there's this shift away from making someone right or wrong, from being the victim or blaming the other person for you know, making us feel bad because they didn't accept our request. And it, it really is responsibility on both sides. Right? The person uh, who's responding to the request and the person making the request. And that's what I think is also so powerful is, is to not identify with somebody's no as something that means something about me. I just, thanks Tree. I just want to say to people, we're going to be, uh, we're recording this and this is going to be broadcast again throughout all of Facebook and, uh, and, and our private email lists. The whole world, Frank. <laughs> so if you don't want your face recorded on this, I'm asking you to please mute your camera because <laughs> I see a lot of people. It's okay with me, but you're, if you would turn your camera off, you won't, we won't need, you know, a release form for you to be in this recording. <laughs> Frank, you want to say something to this or should we move to the next question? Let's move on. Okay. But if, if we are muting cameras, I just want to, um, don't mean to call you out, guys. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm also just seeing uh, Michael and Daniel, your cameras are on. If you wouldn't mind just switching those off, that would be awesome. Thank you. Okay. Um, and Frank, you didn't want to jump in with that? He said to I move on. I feel a lot okay. was said, and I'm, I'm interested in how the conversation continues to unfold. Sure. Okay. Um, so another topic that I kind of want to bring up that, that's been in the field, in the conversations I've been having with women and with men, is this, um, there seems to be a, a, a challenge between, as women, us starting to own our feelings and our frustration and our no. Um, and not having that no and our frustration be something that turns men into the enemy. And I'm interested in how specifically at ISTA we deal with having our no and not, and we talked about it a little bit, but given that, that we are dealing with men and women and the masculine and the feminine, there's so many centuries of, of sexualized stories that we have with each other, right? 
how is the, you know, there is a history, there is, there, there's things that happened, right, that are based around a certain gender. And yet, we all seem to know that, that going down the tunnel, tunnel of gender based abuse is not useful. Um, so my question is, how, how do we deal with the very real things that have happened to us and in the world and still s stay in a place of open hearted compassion and kindness? while also claiming our truth. Does that make sense? I'm asking people to mute their mics. I hear people like shuffling papers and stuff. Um, okay, let me see if I got the question. How do we maintain our truth and not get hostile towards each other given that we have a history of a lot of abuse in our Look, it's, it comes in in our DNA. It's in our DNA strand, it's in our heredity, it's in our cultural uh, linkings. It comes in as trauma before we're even born for most of us. It comes right through the umbilical cord. So how do we make it so that we see our own responsibility in it and, and, and not project and blame onto others? So, I, for me, I'm just going to say this. I, I don't know how else to put it. I have been abused in my life and I have become more empowered because of it. I, it took a while. It's not something that happened like, oh yeah, there's abuse. Oh, now I'm powerful. It wasn't like an overnight thing, but certainly at a training like ISTA, I couldn't learn to clear the emotions that are stored in my body, the emotions that I no longer need. And then I can learn to empower myself and speak to what I was holding. I can speak to it like it no longer has me. Like I don't have to be totally affected by it. And my anger, which I had plenty of, I released. And then I could speak straight and say, you know, to my brother, this is what I was holding. I was holding it against you before I knew that I could release the anger. I mean, I'm just, I'm addressing this from the alchemical response. I feel that ISTA has an alchemy. And in that alchemy, we learn to release things from the past, things that we inherited or things that actually happened. I had a combination of both. And I released those things through this whole, I mean, we spent a long time on this stuff. I released those things. And then I was able to say, wow, I held it this way before. I held it this way before. I don't have to hold it this way anymore. I'm, I'm welcoming each new opportunity, each new relationship as it comes to me and I'm not holding someone I meet now as hostage for something that happened to either my ancestors or me. I'm letting that go, whether it's, whether it happened to me in this lifetime or not. So that's my answer to that. I want to be current. I don't want to have any baggage. I want to be fresh in every situation. And that, and ISTA helps me be that way. Whether I'm on the receiving side of being a participant or even on the facilitator side, I get fresh and fresh and fresh in every moment. Mm -hmm. So inside of that, that's beautiful. And I think we all want to have that freedom to be in the moment. And what I've been tracking with my sisters is it seems like there's a, a confusion that staying angry about what's happened, right? And keeping that up in front of our face is what will keep us safe. That if we go to a place of, I'm gonna let go of the past, I'm gonna let go of the abuse, and I'm gonna be in the moment, then the abuse will keep happening. So there, there, there's like a collapse. Can you speak to that? Yeah. There, I think there's an interim period. Like I discover that I'm angry and I'm fighting. So I'm gonna fight away everything that could possibly threaten me. By the way, I don't think anger is a bad emotion. There are people who think anger is a really bad emotion. I think anger informs us to fight or run, you know, fight or flight. So anger informs me, should I fight or should I run? But there isn't a bear 
going to threaten my life in every single situation. So when I start to dig out the old anger, I get to see I can have anger appropriately in a current situation. I don't need to use that to fight everything. Like there's an interim period where I can like have it for a little while and then I just go, no, you know what? This isn't serving me. Because anger, let me just say, produces cortisol in the body. Cortisol in the body is not good. It's only good for a moment. It's cortisol like is the stress thing. And it's, it robs us and it distorts. And we deal with distortion and as to also as, as a mechanism, like what it means to distort and how that doesn't serve either. So I don't know if I'm answering it exactly what you're asking for. Maybe one of the other panelists wants. Yeah, I'd like to just jump in. Um, so Lori has mentioned a couple of times uh, this word getting current. And, and I, I fully hear what you're saying, August, where, you know, um, from what's happened in the past and the belief that oh, I'm just going to let that go and surrender what happened and forgive. And now I can have a new view. It, it, you know, if it were that simple, we'd all be doing it. But when we actually work with the emotion and what came up and the intensity of what happened and get to actually even work uh, on, on a transpersonal level with our perpetrators, we get to have a neurological release uh, of what's happened. And so that we, we do get current with what's here and uh, somebody's needs to mute <laughs> I, I think melissa who just joined us could you mute your your uh thank you okay so getting current with what's here and now isn't just a mental process it's not something we tell ourselves and then we say we let it go it has to happen in the neurology and through the tools that we use we have an opportunity to to have that release occur in a very full-fledged way um, so when I approach a situation that I'm in front of and I'm getting triggered, it's, it's really, it becomes really obvious to me whether this trigger is coming from stuff that happened 10, 15, 25 years ago, or whether this is just actually, this is right now. And, and, and my communication to the person who's might be causing that trigger is way more clear and direct rather than the you know bringing with me the backlog of hurt and pain and trauma uh, and i'm going to just blow that up in this person's face as if they were responsible for all of it and so when when we work with the tools that we offer there's um there's like a, a dismantling of all of that backlog right it gets to get processed through it's digested if you will and in that process of digesting those uh, those old emotions which are not negative but they've been taking residence in our psyche for a long time and are obscuring how we see the world and how we see other people when we get to digest that there's freedom and not only is there freedom there's there, you know, there's a freedom to how to be to be with people in the current moment and and with a new view with just the view of the, of, of the now who who's actually being presented in front of me but then from that we also gain power and that power is not a power over it's a personal power it's a power it's an empowerment that says i have power to choose right now and i can feel and sense what might be coming up even if i can still feel the little tendrils from the past come in but i can identify that and say oh got it this is this is that piece let me move my energy let me let me do some let me do some tools and actually work with this and now i can get even more current again and work with and, and deal with what's happening in front of me and it's amazing and you know even those of us who are facilitators of this work we've been doing it forever like Still, I gain so much from this. Uh, not that long ago, just once again, think, oh, there's something coming up for me right now. I'm making it personal. Let me go move my energy and then clear that so that I can have a genuine conversation with this person. So it's, it's, it's a, a lifetime of work. And yet we can also arrive in the present moment with so much more power and so much more freedom that... Um, life begins to shift. Our view of life totally begins to transform. Yeah, that's definitely aligned with my experience. Um, something that stood out while you were talking, you know, when you talk about clearing and you talk about moving the energy, those are terms that kind of get thrown around a lot. And can you say more about that? Like, what does that look like? Um, to someone who's not familiar with what that means. 
in go this, ahead. do you go want ahead. to say the truth? Oh, no, go ahead, go ahead. In the system of chakras or chakras in the body, which consists of seven of seven main ones in the body, a lot of uh, where our sex area and our first chakra, our root area, the anus, those places store memories of pleasure and pain, cellular memories. Um, it could be in second grade, the school bus splashed mud on me to I was abused or touched inappropriately by someone. I mean, it can, those memories get, get stuck in the low, what's called the lower chakras. And also um, the first chakra where we sit, the root has to do with safety and security. Those are the issues that have to, that are, that are lodged in the anus actually. And so um, moving the energy means sending energy to the bottom of the body and um, moving it means like activating it sexually, but not necessarily having sex, breathing in and making sound in such a way that that energy starts to move up the body and out. So it could be any trauma, any embarrassment, any humiliation. Plus it could be getting a Valentine's card, somebody asking me to dance. I mean, all the positive and the negative memories, the pleasure and the pain, coupled with survival and safety and security, get mixed together down there. And so when we say move the energy, we mean focus, send some energy, do some breathing, do some squeezing, do some, some moving of it, activating, and then letting it go. So that we're actually digging out the things Tree was just talking about. We're digging out the baggage of the past and possibly the baggage of our ancestors because that's where it all resides in the body. That's just the place where it is. And if anyone doubts me, look up the chakras and look at one and two and find out what the issues are there. Those are the issues that are contained. Nice. Um, okay, so what I kind of pulled out of what you were saying, which is probably a new idea for m many people, it was for me, was the connection between sexual repression body shame closure around my sensuality and my sexuality and my ability to be alive in my body and like contributing to the world in, in, a, in a full alive congruent way that I don't think that those two things together I, I, I don't think many people are aware of that I certainly wasn't can you speak to that a little bit yeah, it just popped in for me. There's something, mm. we, we do this at ISTA, there's something called the Cartman Drama Triangle. Everybody kind of knows these roles because they kind of come out swinging in these roles. Victim, rescuer, perpetrator. And that hats change. Like today I could be the victim, tomorrow I could be the perpetrator, and I could also be the rescuer. When those issues are unresolved and we want to make a difference in the world, we can't, we set about to rescue humanity and we don't, <laughs> we don't do that well at it. Mm -hmm. So it's actually to get off that drama triangle all together and create in life and respond to life, create, respond, create, respond, create, respond, create. And then it just becomes a big creation. But until we actually see that we've played the role of those three things, victim, perpetrator, rescuer, and some of us are better at rescuing, and some of us have been accused of perpetrating, and some of us are, are just the ultimate victims. And the fact is that if we move off of that, that diagram, that, that paradigm, and move into creation and responding, and we can only do that by doing the work, like there's no shortcut to this. We have, to, we have to learn this. Each of us in our own way has to learn this. So that's how we, that's how we uh, in trainings like ISTA, we, we find our way off of, the, off of that triangle. And it's really important. And it sounds like the access to that is through the body, is through free, freeing up the yeah. blocked energy and getting energy moving so we're no longer trapped in the pattern a victim, abuser, or rescuer. 
Is that exactly. okay? Exactly. I'm looking to see. I think there's a question here. There are there's some a, questions. There's a good question from Alan, and he's asking about what does the shamanic part uh, entail in ISTA, and does it involve plant medicines or any uh, psychoactive substance? Mm -hmm. I'm going to answer that. Uh, Alan, very good question. Uh, there's been, you know, oh, the, the trend is every time we're speaking shamanic in today's day and age, it's uh, linked to uh, some kind of substance uh, like um, plant medicine yeah. to get us into altered states of real reality. That's basically what a shamanic, the shamanic piece is, is can you enter altered states of a reality, extraordinary reality, and affect using energy, using energy to affect uh, manifest reality. And uh, at ISTA, the only tools that we're using are breath, sound, and movement. So it's how do we marry breath, sound, and movement through different exercises and rituals uh, in order to induce uh, sta uh, extraordinary states. And extraordinary states look like any state that allows you to drop truly into um, your uh, inner self and start to be able to uh, listen to messages that are coming to you from yourself. And uh, we do this uh, with breath, sound, and movement using the different tools. And uh, we were talking earlier about... Um, moving traumas that we uh, have, whether they came from a person, uh, a system, or whatnot. We actually go into a process where we channel or call in or bring presence to uh, the person that has wronged us, whatever you want to call it, and we have a dialogue and we, we lead you through this beautiful process which allows you to move any blocked energy between you and the individual. And when we deal with it on that level, um, we actually affect our reality and how we meet reality. And this is more the shamanic aspects that we are playing with at ISTA and has nothing to do with uh, the trendy plant medicine uh, modalities. Thank you. Thanks for clearing that up, Frank. Um, let's see. So, so I, I want to read a question from, a, from someone who, who wrote in last night, if I might, because I think it really speaks to one of the core aspects of ISTA. Wait, so, wait, wait. Somebody wrote a question about yeah. the victim. Somebody just wrote a question in about how victims can unknowingly become perpetrators. Let's do that one. Yeah, I just saw that on there. So um, I wanted to just say, um, it's, it, how can I say this? When somebody like persists in being a victim and takes all your time, my time, someone's time about like being in that victim, 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 victim story, eventually somebody who's been trying to rescue them starts to feel like put upon. I mean, this is the way I understand it. Like they start to feel put upon like, wow, this person just not going to give it up. Like, I'm, can't they see I'm trying to rescue them? And like, that doesn't work. And so then um, the victim becomes angry. Like, I don't want to be rescued. You know, leave me alone. And then they become angry and then start perpetrating on people who try to rescue them. None of these three roles work, by the way. That's what I want. The major message to the person who wrote this, I think it's Daniel, uh, the victim the, perp the victim, the perpetrator, and the rescuer do not work. They're not a healthy means to have interactions with people. And those of us who, I mean, it's, you know, we think about men riding in on their white horse to, sa to save the damsel in distress. But anybody could be riding on a white, think they're riding in on a white horse, and it doesn't work. People basically have to rescue themselves. And we're offering a way to do that. <laughs> you can rescue yourself and become super empowered by doing the work that it takes with people who've done the work. I mean, we're just really a few steps ahead of you. We've had our own issues. None of us came here without issue. And that's why we can deliver this because we did the work. We, we were, some of us were desperate to do it. We had to, I had to rescue myself from my own traumas, from my own plagues, from my own whatever. 
Um, and so we all have to do that. Those three things on the Cartman drama triangle don't work. And you know, if you've been trying to rescue people, <laughs> you actually know that it doesn't work. All right, go ahead. Go back. There is, there is another question and I feel called to speak into it, if that's okay. Uh, the question was um, about it, uh, how is ISTA different from Tantra? Oh, good. And the fact that in Tantra, we commonly um, refer to breath, sound, and movement as a, a main tool that is used. And uh, Michael, thank you for responding to that question. I, I do want to make an, an adjustment to what you said. Uh, I, uh, I think it's important to make a distinction because uh, ISTA is actually not promoting itself as a Tantra training. Uh, while we borrow from that tradition in some ways, but breath, sound, and movement itself are universal. And uh, Tantra certainly doesn't have ownership of breath, sound, and movement. And, um, and I would add that we also include a fourth element, which is intention. And intention is probably the umbrella that is holding all of it uh, together with the breath, with the sound, with the movement. Uh, we are um, purposely not going about the world saying this is a Tantra training because we are not actually authentically teaching Tantra. We teach a variety of modalities and tools that come from many traditions and also are um, added to by new facilitators that come in. And so we can't really say, oh, it's this or it's that. And that's what's beautiful about this work is that we're not trying to um, specifically appropriate it to a tradition. We are using what works and, and it does effectively work. Uh, so um, just wanted to make that one distinction is that um, the work that we do is, is not specific to Tantra it may include some aspects, but it's not necessarily that. Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right, can, so I'm gonna go back to Michael's comment, if that's okay. So he said, Michael Landis says, it seems to me the root of rape culture is a lack of understanding that we are beautiful individuals. Most men are taught not to enjoy their own sensuality and sexuality, and therefore they look to feel it through others. It seems to me that if we raised our children to love themselves, to enjoy how their own bodies feel, this would nip rape culture in the bud. No longer would many men feel empty without a woman's energy. They would view another human being as an amazing addition to an already full life versus a needed resource. So how do we make this kind of self-love part of child rearing, part of our day-to-day -day life? How do we, how does ISTA bring that kind of self-love to the forefront in a way that's not narcissistic, it's not self-indulgent, it's not like I'm just going to lay around in self-pleasure all day because that's what I want to do. When I worked, right, it's not an indulgent thing. How does ISTA address this? Well, I'm thrilled to say, I, I, I'm just like, first of all, thank you for that. Oh, I'm so moved by that question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thrilled to say that we've just established a division called ISTA Families. And um, there are a bunch of ISTA facilitators who have taken the lead on this. And there, uh, there's a, there are two curriculums being developed. One is for children and one is for teens. I've... I don't have time right now to do this. So I have a whole teen curriculum that I sent to someone else and she's going to be representing that, my part in that for teens. Um, so the first thing is to, as an adult, get straight. You know what I mean? Like, I don't mean straight as in gay, straight, bi. I'm not talking about sexual preference. It's to get straight with self. And that's what we do for adults in Insta. And Insta is now taking on and will be unfolding and unraveling a new program that has to do with children and teens, maybe separate children and teens. There's the concern for two things. One is to have children grow as healthy in their bodies. And there's another concern to not have them overly sexualized too soon because the parents don't want their kids to be anti-healthy sexuality either, you know, like become super prudish because their parents were like totally super sexy. So there, there's like some, 
moderation in it being considered and people uh, taking on educating families. And uh, in Israel, just this past weekend, some ISTA people did a um, young people's temple. So the people were like 18 to 21 and they just had a three day workshop of exploring their sensuality and their sexuality in a very safe and sacred way. So it's happening, we're unrolling it. It's just, you know, it'll take a little time for it to roll out to the general public, but it is happening. Can you say more about what happens in the adult training around embodiment? Like how do we learn? I, mean, I, I know for me, I, I've been in the ISTA field now four times and it took me a minute to actually feel comfortable in my body. And it worked, I did, it happened. But I, I couldn't tell you why that happened. Right. I haven't been around That's enough to distinguish it. So can you speak to how does one go from feeling like just someone seeing my bare legs is something to be frightened of to a space where if I feel like I, I could dance naked to my favorite song and have no concern about it. How does that shift happen. So the ISTA curriculum is like impeccable. And um, what I've seen is that each exercise or ritual that is uh, being uh, invited um, builds up on the, on, the next, on the next exercise or ritual. So that being said, it's like nobody's going from uh, you know, scared to show their leg to being completely naked in a split second. Uh, and what I think comes up for a lot of people when we speak about this is like, oh, I could never do that. Uh, I don't want to do that. And I, so I won't do ISTA. So I want to make the foundational statement that at ISTA, you don't do anything that you're not ready to do or you don't want to do. So everything is 100% within your pace and your consent. But there comes a moment where there is um, the, an exercise that is going to be introduced to you where uh, nudity is invited. And usually that is an invitation into um, personal power. And when you're at the cliff, when you're at the edge of experiencing this uh, invitation, it, you know, you make the choice. And I think the choice is easy to be made because you've come to open. So you can't really open if you're, if you're, or you're moving with the intention of being closed. And once open, it's like, wow, there is so much freedom here. What was I so afraid of? And that is like just a rush. It's a major rush of um, uh, excitement, aliveness, vitality. And from that moment on, it's like you're meeting life from this new, fresh, alive space. And then life starts tasting better in that moment. And therefore, everything that else is built on from that moment on is uh, again, um, the next step of the path. And the last point I want to talk about is one of the things that makes it easy to do is I like to think that all the exercises that are, as ISTA are being presented in a very sacred way. And it's, uh, it's the intention of bringing the sacred into these practices that allows us to uh, feel a sense of, number one, remembering of the magic that we used to live in when we, this used to be okay. And number two, that there is a, a certain level of safety because I feel the sanctity of the moment. And so when we feel that, it's like, yes is easy to, to be given. And when we're talking about this, like, uh, Me Too movement, because I think that was the theme of, of this conversation. It's like, at the core is the piece of what is our body trying to tell us in each and every moment. And when we're disconnected from our body, um, it's hard to really hear like what's really alive. So at the ISTA program, we're, in, we're helping people to get back embodied into the body so that every time something is happening, once we're facing stimuli that's coming from the outside of us, our body has an intelligence and that can inform us. 
And so when our body says no, and we know what a no feels like in our body, that then we have to find the courage to speak it and to say it and to own it. And uh, that's the personal responsibility aspect of which we are trying to instill in every individual that comes to ISTA. And the real world outside is sometimes a bit more complicated and you know violent crime is uh, is something that you know goes outside the spectrum of what we're what we're offering in terms of empowerment but for every situation we've entered where we weren't clear about what our boundary is or what our actually our desire was when we're not clear with what our boundaries and our desires are we only contribute to creating murky situations, unclear situations, situations that can lead to misunderstandings, misunderstandings that lead to a bad movement, a bad movement that leads to an assault, and then boom, we've entered that uh, drama triangle. And so what we're trying to do is empower people with the understanding or the intuitive connection with their body and to really move from the body wisdom versus like all the mental chatter that's not really embodied. Beautiful. That's really well said. <clears throat> um, I, I want to put this in in response to, to you, Frank, and, and to Lori, that and just for the, the listeners that, you know, my, my first ISTA experience, I was a no pretty much the whole training. And I'm a pretty out there person. I'm ballsy, you know, I say, I was a no. That was my whole training. No, no. And then by the end, this one gentleman, we were going to do this exercise. And I was like, you can touch my feet. And that was about as far as we got. And that was a massive transformation for me. So I, I would just want to let people know that even though there's an invitation to be more, um, you know, vulnerable in, in the human body bag that we live in, there you have permission to say no and that your no is actually really, really respected and encouraged because that's how you know where your yes is. So there's no pressure to keep participating if you don't want to. And when you find your no, it's like you understand how to access the momentum of what it feels to say no in a, in a, ver in a way that has energetic authority. Because if we're saying like a no, as in like, maybe it's a no, then that's an invitation for like people, aggressors or perpetrators to, to keep advancing because it's a, it's a statement of weakness. And unfortunately there are people that prey on that. And, and so, what we're what we're speaking into is like getting into a comfort zone with energetic authority so that when a no is said or a no is present that actually i believe that no so i'm not gonna fuck with that <laughs> you know mm -hmm. so so that's and then at the same time it's like we want to encourage people to find their yes because mm -hmm. the inability to say no to something that you don't want is as difficult sometimes to claiming your desire and part of what we're doing at ISTA is saying, you have permission without any shame or guilt to claim your desire and we celebrate when you do that. And especially when you, when you get your needs met. And that's something to celebrate too in the world. Mm. Mm -hmm. oh, very good. So there's, there was a question about who, when did ISTA start and who founded it and like that. Mm. And Shambhika, I'm gonna, you're one of the founders of ISTA, you know, like you were there at the beginning. So I just see that and I don't want to ignore it. Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, so Baba Des Nichols, uh, who is our founder and had a, a beautiful temple in Sedona, Arizona, saw that there were many, uh, many sexual healers and tantra teachers and Taoist teachers and people around the country and internationally that were out doing their thing and that everybody was sort of doing it solo and his vision was to bring people together and uh and connect and share teachings and he had a body of knowledge also that he wanted to bring forward and that started off the conferences that uh, that ha started happening in Sedona, maybe I want to say 2004, 2005. 
And from there, the, uh, there were some trainings that started to come into place. He started to bring forward some of, some of his body of work and wanted to develop a, at the time was a, uh, called a Daka Dakini training uh, that um, were sort of tools that if you were going to be out there being a Daka or Dakini or sexual healer of, of any sort, um, that there were some basic tools that, uh, of your, that, that you needed to have, not so much to to be a, a, you know, a sovereign being, an empowered being with your boundaries, with your nose, with, with, uh, with your emotional body current. So um, I just wanna say hi, Benita, welcome. If you wouldn't mind, please mute yourself uh, on, the, on the camera. Yeah, thank you, thanks. Yeah, so we started, uh, so he needed a co-facilitator and I was referred to him and we, started the, the first official training uh, and that so th there was there was things that were happening before that and about we met in 2006 2007 we we started to do the work 2008 we put out the trainings and um, it was a, a very um, it was a very small training to begin with, but we, when once we started growing it, people started showing up that weren't at all in the field of sexual healing and who just wanted to know the tools, who found that really there was a real um, transformational aspect to, to what they were receiving. And so we took out the whole portion of the practitioner piece and made it a training for everyone. And that became the spiritual sexual shamanic experience. And so that's how it started back in Sedona and now we are in about, I'd say, 37 countries. I think next year we'll have, I, I've lost count now. Uh, we're adding Fiji and lots of places. Uh, and, and it continues to grow because, because it's effective, because it, it's, it's supportive, and because I think that the tribe that gets formed through the work itself is, is something that you don't find anywhere else, that level of, of, of connection, of authenticity, of freedom, but also of, of, of truth-telling and, um, and a very, you know, just becoming really grounded in yourself uh, together with others is, is something very, I think very needed in, in the world today. So we're excited to continue to grow with all of you, hopefully. Thank you, Triambika. Um, so there was a question about shame and how it's healed. And I was also going to talk about or ask you to speak you, about the shadow. Can you shadow. hold one second? Yeah. Can you hold one second? Sure. I also wanted to add that many of us had our own schools and we decided mm. to come in and join forces. The thing that makes us so powerful in the world is that we came from and we brought our own bodies of knowledge and we've joined forces, which I've never worked with people before, really. And now I have teams of people that I work with, so I'm not alone. And mm -hmm. I always have other people to, to uh, bounce off of in, a, in any given training. And that to me has been, it's changed my life, my life that way, professionally and personally. Yes. Uh, that. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I was a teacher in my own right. And Laura, you had a, a whole school that you were running and, um, and, and, and others, uh, uh, lots of our uh, lead facilitators and, and co-facilitators, it's, it's, it's not about you start off um, fresh and this is the first thing you do, maybe for some now coming on, but most have had their own schools and practices and participants and you know doing their own thing. So yeah, thank you for, I'm so glad you brought that in because I was thinking about that earlier. It's a really important piece here. I'd like to ask Michael if he wants to come in and, and um, just tell people about the offer and then we can continue on. But just in case anyone, there's a lot of people on the call right now and in case anyone leaves sure. us, I'd like to hear them. And then August, maybe we could resume with questions. Sure, absolutely. So Michael, wherever you are, are you somewhere? Hi everyone, how are you tonight? Thank you so much Great. for being on the call. Hi Lori, thank you. Thank you everyone. Um, so tonight we have two very special offers. Uh, the first one is for the upcoming ISTA Level 1 training in Flat Rock, North Carolina. Uh, it's for women only. And ladies, if you'll register by October 25th, you'll save $200 on your tuition. Uh, the regular price is $1,995 US, so you'll only pay $1,795, again, for women only. And the special ends at midnight Pacific time, October 25th. Uh, for more information, go ahead and PM August, or Augie, as she's known on the uh, chat tonight. 
the link to the Flat Rock training registration along with times and dates is in the chat room. Uh, the next offer is for the Michael, ISTA. Yes. Michael, before you go on, the, the training isn't for women only. The offer is for no, women only. No, the offer only. is for clear. women only. Okay, good. That's correct, okay, good. yes. The training <laughs> is for men and women, but, but okay, for good. women, this is going to be, yeah, thank you. Um, and the next offer uh, is for the ISTA Level 1 training in Oracle, Arizona. Again, times and everything will be listed inside uh, the chat room. Um, that's going to be near Tucson. This is a 24-hour deal, so you're going to have to hop on this and act now. From the end of this SIP call and for 24 hours, you'll have the opportunity to save $100 off of the super early bird price, which is $1,750. So if you register within the next 24 hours, your tuition will be $1,650, and that is for both men and women. Okay, and uh, act now. You definitely want to get in on that deal. Uh, if you have any questions or for more information about either of these trainings, just go to the chat room and click on the links provided. Okay, I'll make sure that they're in there directly. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, okay, so someone had asked about how do we heal shame, and it kind of dovetails into what I wanted to bring up is the work we do around the shadow, which seems to be a piece of our spiritual development that kind of gets stepped over a lot. And I see a connection between really doing deep shadow work and healing from shame. Can you speak to that? All right, I'll, I'll push my buzzer. Um, <laughs> I feel like we're on the um, So shame, healing shame. Well, I'd say that every single thing in the ISTA level one in the SSSEX training is somehow connected to shame mm. and, uh, and like releasing shame. So whether it's uh, the first three days where we're only relating to self, but within a group and self, like I have needs. I have, it's something Frank said before about my own desires, giving voice to my desires that I'm allowed, I'm allowed to have this body, I'm allowed to have desire, I'm allowed to be a woman in a woman's body, and, and men are allowed to be men in men's bodies, and women's bodies react a certain way, and men's bodies react a certain way, like that's all normalized in the first three days of the first, of the level one training. That's like, yep, I'm in this body. And then there are people who are gender bending, and for people who are gender bending, that's completely allowed it's completely okay to be in a man's body kind of functioning as a woman and it's completely okay to be a woman in a woman's body functioning as a man. like we don't discriminate about that um it's okay to be whoever you are however it occurs and to and to own it so that's like day one two three and then after day three there's how do i interact and have no shame when I ask for what I want, say no, whatever. So it's all practice. There's lots of practice and practice and practice and the rest of the exercises bring us into interaction with other people. And again, there's places where shame needs to just be uncovered and shadow work, things that we're denying. When you've mentioned shadow, the way I look at shadow is, I'm denying this thing in myself and I'm making it wrong outside of me and in fact, it's very alive and well in me, but I haven't given voice to it yet. We shamanically give voice to those things in the ISTA level one training, to the things that maybe we've been in denial about. Um, and so as everything gets light shined on it, we start to be unashamed. Um, just, you know, again, it's a process. It's little by little. For some people, it's like bam. And for some people, it just, it takes a while. I have discovered in myself uh, that, that there, are, there are nuances to shame. Uh, that there are things that surprise me, even in relationship to my partner, where all of a sudden we'll be relating and then there'll be this little piece of something like I'll be really enjoying myself and all of a sudden I'll pull back and I'll notice, wow, I just pulled back. My partner will say, well, what's that? And I'll go, oh, that was like a little vestigial trace of shame. 
but at least I can name it now. Since it's the, I can name all of that and I can just take responsibility for that, I, that I may still have some. It's like an onion peeling the layers back and then there's more and then there's more and then there's more. Again, inherited cultural messages, religion, all kinds of stuff that put it there so we would be able to be controlled. Like, let's just face it, if we're totally sexual beings and we can own that and be unashamed about that, we're not able to be controlled. And that's like a different political force. <laughs> but that doesn't have to do with abuse. That has to do with all consent. Don't interact without it. And then is do you learn how to give consent or not give consent? Clear, straight, and direct. So that relates to the question that just came up and it says, <clears throat> how is BDSM or the King community integrated in ISTA? Do you want to say a word or you want to let me do that one? Um, you, you do it. All right. So and for us, BDSM... We have four minutes. We'll got it. Four minutes. Got it. BDSM and kink are not part of the like ISTA curriculum, especially in the level one. Um, but what the level one does give you, the experience, is it gives you um, the confidence to claim your desire or your interest or your curiosity or, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's more about uh, allowing that experience into your life where maybe you would not have allowed it. And those that are already playing it, it feels like it gives them more confidence to be who they are in that, in that place if it brings them uh, pleasure or um, it is operating on the uh, level of healing as well. So what I mean by that is that at ISTA, what we're also um, offering is we're um, taking people on a journey where they're uh, using sexual life force energy and se uh, certain sexual practices per se um, as a way for uh, healing uh, trauma, emotional blocks and whatnot. And that comes with intention and again, the sacred. So <clears throat> when you bring intention and the sacred uh, to anything that you're practicing, whether it be BDSM, kink, eye gazing, massage, or the most energetic tantric sex you've ever experienced, it uh, is raised into a, a place that is, um, can be healing or expansive or uh, revelatory. And so that's how I think we incorporate uh, BDSM and kink in the program is that uh, the work that we do is foundational for people to feel um, more full and more confident in their um, experience of whatever they're um, practicing. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. So, August, we have like two minutes. Yeah. Well, um, are there any more questions that anyone has? I don't think so. So I, I pretty much covered what I had. Um, is there anything left for you guys that's bubbling up, that's alive in you? That I have one piece that I wanna offer uh, in one of the questions that you asked that uh, I didn't get around to say a word on, but it was in mm -hmm. and around like what to do with women who need to express themselves but don't want to, like that there's not this attack energy around it. And I just wanna speak to the brothers. And it's like, this is a time where um, you know it's a time for us to be in the mode of active listening. We don't need to change anything. We don't need to justify anything. We don't need to uh, convince anybody of anything. If we got one thing out of the hashtag Me Too movement as men, is that it's time to listen. And so the invitation is really to come into the fourth key of Tantra, which is presence and listening and allow everything that needs to be said uh, to be heard, integrated, and then uh, the invitation is, how do you wanna show up to that? How do you wanna show up to your sister, uh, which is ultimate, ultimately you? How do you wanna show up with a reflection of yourself in, in the other gender? How do you wanna love these people? How can we correct 
the way we've been behaving? How can we um, stand for uh, sisters without being the white knight and the rescuer when these situations occur or they come out in, in, in our uh, vision? So that's what I would say to the brothers and to the women as a man uh, is that when you come to ISTA and you learn the tools, if you move your emotional energy, it won't necessarily come out as an attack, but more as a sharing, which would make would makes it a lot easier to uh, receive uh, and hear, and will support us to uh, make those uh, steps to meet you, uh, versus if it's uh, attack and telling us that the whole uh, of masculinity is wrong and bad and perpetrator. And in some ways we are, uh, but ultimately in the individual cases is not necessarily the case. And so to give us the, the greatest space to come together is to, for men to listen and women to, uh, to move their emotional energy before they deliver it. And ultimately, as long as we have the gender war, we will continue to have war on this planet. So as we are committed to healing the gender war and doing what it takes individually to heal those processes, it is only then that we will give our, our planet a chance to heal uh, uh, around uh, war and blood, uh, bloodshed. And those are my last words. Thank you so much for giving me that space to say that. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Whew. Wow, this is an amazing call. Thank you, Triambika and Lori and Frank for being a part of this conversation. And thank you for being my teachers and my mentors um, and my collaborators on changing the conversation on the planet around sexuality. Um, just thank you. And I, I look forward to having more of these conversations. I'm going to have Michael make the offer. Okay. Again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. What a wonderful call. We had some really great questions. Uh, so again, tonight, we have two special offers going. Uh, the first one is for the upcoming ISTA Level 1 training in Flat Rock, North Carolina. It is for women only. The training is not for women only, but this particular um, uh, special offer is for women only. Ladies, if you register by October 25th, you'll save $200 on your tuition. Uh, the regular price is $1,995, so you will only pay $17.95, again, for women only, and the special ends at midnight Pacific time, October 25th. Now, for more information, go ahead and PM August, and the link to the Flat Rock training registration, along with times and dates, is in the chat room. Uh, the next offer is for the ISTA Level 1 training in Oracle, Arizona. That's near Tucson. This is a 24-hour deal, so you're going to need to act now. So from the end of this SSSIP call and for 24 hours, you'll have the opportunity to save $100 off of the super early bird price, which is $1,750. Now this super, bird, super early bird price is only going to last until October 31st. So if you register within the next 24 hours, your tuition will be $1,650. And that is for both men and women. So act now. If you'd like more information about either of these trainings, go to the chat room, click on the links provided, and uh, you'll be able to find out more. Also, you can PM us. That information is listed as well. We'd be happy to help you out and to get you uh, registered. So thank you again, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us tonight for this special SIP call. Thank you for our moderator and also for our panel uh, and our guests. We really appreciate you. Thank you so much and have a wonderful evening. And we look forward to seeing you at ISTA Level 1. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Good job. Good job, team. <laughs> <laughs>